Hello and welcome to Scratch That Itch, where curiosity makes us tick. We are here to start some meaningful conversations and today we have with us a service designer, an occasional illustrator and a full-time disruptor, the founder of Beyond, Ishita. Hi Ish, welcome to the show. Hi Ankita, thanks so much for inviting me to this amazing initiative. Before we actually start our conversation that we're here for, why don't you tell me a little bit about Beyond? I know it's one of India's only full stack service design studios. That's really something. The last two and a half years especially have been a roller coaster. Like we're slowly moving towards putting India on the service design map of the world. Yeah, like we've worked with everyone from governments to charities and businesses and we've been able to design and build services. You rightly mentioned that everybody was doing this, what is UI, what is UX? And suddenly you throw this term around service design that nobody has heard of. (laughs) So it's, it's quite interesting. You know, that leads me a little bit to today's conversation, which is the itch that we are going to be scratching, designing for services and business. So let's start with this exact thing. What really is, you know, service design? Quite simply put, service design is designing for services. And I'd say that service design has existed for as long as people have been helping each other do things. So even in the recent times, from what I have experienced, businesses have started seeing the potential in design only in the last four to five years. Like, uh, Initially, when when I started working, the industry was very tech first. But now you see design first companies. You see a lot of companies who say that, you know, we are design first. We first design and then we see how technology can adapt to what we're trying to build here. Uh, Moving a little bit ahead, I know you mentioned, you know, that people are going design first. But, you know, technology is also a big aspect. And that's how we functioned for so long, where tech was at the core of any product or service that we were looking at. So now with this new model, which is designed first, how do you see all of this coming together where it's technology, business and design? I don't think we can separate business, tech and, you know, innovation from each other. This is my problem statement and this is what it looks like to solve for it. Till you don't experience a problem like the user does, I don't think you can design a service that would actually work in the long run. So basically, I think what I'm able to hear is that technology, design, and all of these are more tools, but you basically have to keep the problem in the center to be able to solve for anything. 100%. The problem and the user, right? Everything that we do is for the user. One of the main things that you experience is that there is a gradual shift over five or six months where user first becomes 50% user and 50% business. So that entire business understanding comes once you step into the actual industry and then you realize that, okay, I am here. I have to fulfill my users' needs, but the company also needs to make some money out of it. Like it needs to have some monetary implications as well. Yeah, I think just very interesting thing that you mentioned, which is, you know, every designer aspires to be human centric and we claim to be as design thinkers, human centric. And clearly, once we come into the industry, like you mentioned, we realize it has to be a balance, which is more of co-creation. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. You know what this human centered design really means, what it is like to design for our customers and how do you really balance it out with the needs of your clients? Like the initial part of the engagement goes into a space where you're just trying to identify the problem in itself and what the proper approach to solve for it would be. I feel like a big part of service design is actually going deeper into that problem statement and understanding whether what they think is the solution is actually the right solution. So (laughs) that's why research comes into play. That's where you have all your multiple lenses. You do competitor research and you try to understand that If X is the problem, then firstly, what is the right approach to solve for it? Has this person come for, you know, just user research? Are they here to add an existing service to, you know, their their pool of offerings? Or are they trying to build something from scratch? I noticed you used innovation instead of design. They've become such, you know, words that are very easily interchangeable. So I want to take a moment and even talk about that along with the process. So what really is innovation or what does innovation mean? You know, is it a process? Is it the final product? Uh, And, you know, what it really is? I think there are two things. One is a person as an innovator who's trying to build something new. 
or who is trying to solve for something and then the second thing is a person who has the capability to identify innovative things so i think again it would be safe to say that innovation is more like a concept and based on your context it could either be a mindset it could be a culture it could be the process that you're following to get to your solution or innovation could be in the solution that you finally design I think the next again is a term or like a terminology we hear a lot that is claimed by fellow designers that we are designing for end to end journey. So how important are customer journeys and how can one sort of uh, break down any customer journey for like a service or a brand? I don't think you can practice service design without a customer journey. I don't think you can practice any design actually without a customer journey. It all comes down to putting it out there. Like if I'm not if i'm not writing a step by step account of what my customer is doing i am missing out on so much even just from point a to point b it is so essential to recognize that is this a point where a person takes a decision is this a point where a person is reacting to something intuitively is it a point where this person requires support so in order to even build those lenses and understand those things you first need to have it all out there right like how is a person going from a to b and then b to c and only then can you say that okay how do i support this person better through the step now diving a little bit deeper into you know this journey bit that you spoke of um how do you even decide who your customer is because your customer and users could be sometimes different so what are some factors that you keep into mind when a brand comes to you and let's say even if it's a kids brand it's the easiest to take up as a conversation because clearly they're not the ones buying our products so how do you really identify who should be your customer and who should be your user i think it's very simple a customer is someone who pays for your service a user is someone who uses it so i know that when a brand comes to us there is a paying customer and then there is a user who may or may not be the customer right so i think all the service experiences are then mapped with that mindset that is a touch point customer centric or is it user centric so in this case uh, you'd have two journeys if i'm not wrong one would be a user journey and one would be a customer journey because both you'd be looking from different lenses as well so even these i think their starting point is similar and then they diverge at some point i think one of the interesting use cases if you have any where i can only imagine the number of journeys you've had to go through so one of the projects and what's the maximum number of journeys you've actually created for that project so far we were designing for the government i will not get into details we were designing for one unit of the government of india we were seeing how farmers can buy and sell land right in rural areas how can farmers buy and sell land agricultural land to be precise and oh my god there are so many stakeholders involved right there is a lawyer there is an auditing team there is like the farmers themselves there is a buyer seller there is and all these touch points are so segregated like there was no one place to go to to get everything done from end to end which is why service design came into the play but yeah i think in that project we had around 12 different users and they were all coming into the same platform and even it's it's not as easy as saying you know there was a lawyer involved there were different types of lawyers my team was just like how do we map this where do we map this who do we talk to what is going on so that was really interesting because i think that is the most scaled up service we designed also i think uh, one thing that i'm really interested to know especially with this project is because design is a lot of converging and diverging constantly and taking that decision because the minute you diverge it's very easy to get lost in that black hole of research of just creating these more journeys because you come up with a interesting touch point which requires another journey for you to create so how do you make these decisions which is where to diverge and where to converge i think a good practice to follow is to always have that sensibility of what are we trying to do here what is the intention behind designing this and in the end what should be the point of you know success not 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 success but what would it mean for the service to be counted as accomplished how do i make sure that what i design for requires the lowest amount of investment not just in terms of money but also time you cannot ignore how product and service have now become the same thing everything has now become like one continuous journey and 
Now, if you see services are judged more on functionality and usefulness. I think jumping a little bit more into technology and especially, you know, we've spoken of how we've evolved from postal era to the internet era. Even when you talk specifically of this internet era, the internet connection and the way we experience it has dramatically changed over the past two decades. So what has been, what has this journey been like from web 1.0 to web 3.0, where we're talking about decentralized internet? This is such a tricky topic because I don't think I'm an expert at web 3 yet. But I think uh, from web 1 to web 3, what people are trying to change is to democratize the internet. If you think about web 1, web 1 was just about consuming data. You had web pages, you went online, you read information, you learned about things. That was web one. Web two is when the user could start responding to this data. So that's where your social media came in. There was content and then you could accept, reject, share. You could do multiple things with that content. You could also generate content. So it was not a one-way street anymore where something was posted and then you were looking at it. You were posting, you were then getting into this whole era of social validation and likes and comments and, you know, getting that whole response online. And you will also see how careers underwent a dynamic shift, right? I'd love for you to dive deeper because you spoke of how in Web 2.0, it was more about engagement from, you know, Web 1.0. So what is Web 3.0 and where do we come in and how is it affecting service design? I think people are trying to take control of how things move on the internet. So even in Web 2, you still had Amazon, Google, etc. who were capturing your data, right? Although I was although I was posting things and you were liking things, you were posting things, I was liking things. Um, all my data was still going to Google. It was still going to Facebook. I think Web 3.0 is trying to break that and people are trying to take more control of how things move on the internet and they're trying to take that power away from bigger organizations who are using data for multiple purposes. They're selling it, they're using it for revenue. They are just trying to promote new services using that. So I think people are, that's why I think being anonymous is such a big thing on Web 3. Because if you don't know who I am, how will you sell me things? I think it affects in a big manner also because right now Google, the minute you give your data, it goes to Google and almost every other organization can access it from there. But this Web3 breaks that. So it's heavily going to impact uh, service designers being able to map the trends. So what do you think would be the new way to capture trends then? For service design in itself, there are things that would change and things that wouldn't. So uh, I think what wouldn't change is that we're still designing for people and we're still designing for humans, I'd say, who still have those same five core emotions of anger, fear, happiness, sadness, etc. So that bit doesn't change. And I think how someone responds to information doesn't change. But the trick would be more about how to design for a world whose ecosystem is, you know, so tricky. Like, Today, you design for people who are here in the world, doing things, going to jobs, traveling, using commute options, you know, they're booking flight tickets online. But in the virtual world, I don't know how that world is mapped out. I think a safe thing to say is service design has evolved with technology so far and it will continue to as as the metaverse, as Web3 and all these concepts become more and more regular and the adoption increases, we will figure out ways to design for it like we have so far. Yeah, and I think service design, in my opinion, is actually going to come and save this because we're going to be at the initial phase. Like you rightly said, we're not going to know anything. And service design is the best way to really figure out whatever little we can piece by piece and design for this new world uh, that we're looking forward to. Uh, Just... Taking this conversation a little bit ahead, we've spoken of, you know, what it's going to be like uh, or the service design industry is going to look like with Web3. There are still a lot of industries that you've also worked with. And how does service design change? Is it the process that changes? Is it the lenses that changes the minute you're designing for different industries? I know you've worked with femtech, fintech, along with everything else that you've mentioned. So what is really different when you go down to designing a solution? I think the framework more or less remains the same. 
where you know i i know that my bigger process has the same buckets but of course like it all changes with what we're trying to enable am i trying to so i'll i'll give you an example right like we we work with a bank where we were designing for trust and uh, i wish i could share which bank it was but uh, <laughs> you can comment it <laughs> this bank had a lot of customers that were getting defrauded in internet fraud and they were losing customers you know because you've been defrauded and you've lost a lot of money and the bank was like okay our problem here is we want to retain these customers and we're not able to they lost a good like 21% of their customer base through internet fraud across two years and it was scary so they said that hey you know like how can you help us with this and even i thought at that point how can i help you with this you need to stop this from happening <laughs> but but you know that's the thing no matter how full proof your technology is there are innovators who will find loopholes <laughs> that entire practice of you know just undergoing the process of understanding what a defrauded customer undergoes was so crazy because you're talking to a pissed off person who has left the bank and you're asking them hey why did you leave the bank and they're like dude like i lost money do i need a bigger reason <laughs> yeah so in, in that in that bucket of service design where you're designing for trust service design becomes more about psychology and service design becomes more about understanding that although this person is angry they're actually upset but if i take the same service design approach to say a fintech company there i am designing for a different very different emotion right so we we were working with a, we are actually working with a company that does money lending and at very minimized interest rates for uh, people who have a blue collar job and it's like an early payday software now here the customer is very different right nothing wrong has happened to them but they have a fear they have a fear of not being able to meet their needs so psychology comes in in every every like service design process but which emotion you are trying to work with plays a huge role in how you design so if i know that my user has a certain mental framework when they come to my uh, when they come to my app the colors i use the interactions i use the different flows i design are all catering to providing comfort to address that specific emotion it's been more about identifying that emotion and what my user wants to do what my user finds value in and how can i best help them do that with providing value for time and money i think what's really interesting and what i kept hearing and not just in this sense i think it's across our conversation is no matter what sector what service we are designing for ultimately we are des- uh, designing for emotions and behavior of some sort which is very very intriguing and interesting because you're designing for people and that kind of brings us back to our conversation of human centered design so it's just defining your goal and designing for the emotions you really want to evoke or behavior that you really want people to inculcate in and uh, just taking this another step ahead clearly we have a lot of frustrations in our everyday life you know as people or as citizens as customers so what are some industries or some gaps right now that we face in our everyday life which service design has not explored yet or which you think would really benefit from the process that we do Oh, so this is this is like my dream project, but I really want to design for how people vote in India. Every time I've gone out there to vote, I've thought of how well service design can help in this area, right? Because um, if you at, like at least in Bombay, if you see there are different pin codes and different pin codes are assigned different venues to go and vote at, and you have people who are standing in the sun for three hours, four hours for their turn to come. first of all it's really demotivating right like i need to really want to vote firstly to actually undergo all of this and secondly the experience is so bad like something like casting a vote shouldn't have to be so difficult and time consuming and i have personally had experiences where you know my balas balo center it was in a very municipal school where they have just uh, you know you have those uh, open stalls so i'm standing in the 3 hours 
I have seen the line reduced because people are leaving. They're like, I don't want to vote. This is too troublesome for me. So people are fine with that. And and to say that India is a democracy where people cast their votes, services like this should be supported first, right? Where it should be as easy as walking into a place, clicking a button, and getting out. I think service design will. flourish across any industry and i don't think that the service design mindset should be limited to service designers which is exactly why i really support all these design innovation workshops you guys do right you are going and you are increasing the awareness across different industries and the moment people learn these frameworks it becomes a part of your work mindset and that in itself helps you innovate so well at the minute you were talking about democracy as well i think so many light bulbs went off and it's not just limited to that one experience it ha- it is so layered you know the bribing that happens of the vote streamlining that creating an actual system where you can effectively vote i feel like there are many avenues and as a designer if you want to explore them just write about your day and then see where you struggle looking opportunities where everybody else sees problems <laughs> and i think like you rightly also mentioned you know um, especially coming from uk i can only imagine the difference where you're in a place where everything is so systematic structured and again citizen faced versus india where if we were able to say and if this is the right way to put it where we are still facing systematic challenges we've advanced when it comes to services but systems not so much So I would love to hear from you on this itself. Where what was your experience with systems in UK versus in India? I don't think it's right to say that you know UK is more advanced than India. I just feel like these are two very separate ecosystems to design for. So if you see, if you see in India, if you see Bombay especially, I'll talk with the example because I live here. The population is so large. So you cannot copy paste something that works in the UK and expect for it to work. It just won't. It just won't. So to actually have that sense of the ecosystem in which you are designing for is so important because your entire user behavior is modeled around that. So I'll I'll give you like a very uh, funny example that you know I had studied a while back. If you design an app, if you design a game that someone can use on the streets. it will work so much better here because of how much traffic exists but in the uk there would be no audience for it right so two very separate ecosystems two very different user types and india is a people's place uk has very independent services but in india you have someone to press the button for you at the mall's parking ticket machine independent services versus human led services so i feel like that's why when technology also comes in it needs to come in in a way that addresses the current user behavior you can't just come in and start automating everything because your user will get lost now we've spoken a little bit of you know how service designing plays a role in different different industries and we are headed to the future which is, which could be web3 metaverse nobody really knows so if you had to design a future for service design or what does the future of service design look like for you in the next 5 to 10 years of digital as advancements that are happening lot of lot of movement in the femtech space female health is coming into light we're working with brands that you know address pcos through subscription models and you know this because you know you are also in the social social design space that people do understand the value of good health as long as it comes with convenience and I, i'm not talking about like the top 3% who has the time and money to invest in good health i'm talking about good health for everyone so i can only imagine the world that we are going to be living in and uh, all i'm able to hear is a lot of kaching for service designers basically i think let's dive deeper into that why do you think they are coming back what is this shift that has happened in the past couple of years that's actually making people come back to india after they finish their education firstly it's because people are practicing learning like doing their masters in countries which are already they have real like com- uh, you can you can say countries that have good public services where everything is already set so you would just be making something good that is better but in india firstly the type of scale that you can design services at you can't do this anywhere else right now 
द स्केल एट विच सर्विस कैन बी डिजाइन फॉर इज इमेजरेबल लाइक आर पॉपुलेशन इज सो हाई दैट फॉर अ सर्विस डिजाइनर दिस इज द मोस्ट एक्साइटिंग लैंडस्केप टू डिजाइन इन एंड सेकेंडली द इंडियन स्टार्टअप इको सिस्टम इज बूमिंग यू विल नेवर कम बैक टू इंडिया नॉट फाइंड अ जॉब Even today, there are three designers for every hundred engineers. So you will be in demand for the next few years at least. Something like service design flourishes in a space of value because you are spending so much time and energy in understanding what is happening in a certain space. This is another segment which is which came up even before when we were talking about Web three designing for safety, privacy. something that comes to my mind is ethical design clearly you know instagram there's this huge debate with what instagram is doing is it ethical how it's impacting behavior but instagram is just one of the players you know there are so many other what are your thoughts on ethical design do you think we will get in a space where ethical design is implemented by major influential players a challenge that technology or design is yet to solve is how to promote meaningful consumption of data rather than saying that you know oh, okay like all these bad things are happening so this is bad and this shouldn't be consumed just an interesting thought you know again whose responsibility is it is it you know the brand is it the people who are using it or do we need a third mediator to be able to bridge that gap there is actually this really interesting concept which is called the government of the internet and uh, it says that you know the the structure of the internet is actually the structure of power in society when there is a hierarchy you cannot say that only one level is responsible because a hierarchy essentially means that a piece of data or a piece of experience runs through an entire chain so i i feel like everyone has a part to play but it's about identifying what your role is and where you stand in the hierarchy and what is it that you can do to make sure that the consumption is meaningful i don't think it's one person's responsibility but what is really important is how the consumer is going ahead and interacting with it also awesome i think uh, this brings us to our last question we've broadly touched upon the role of user like you rightly mentioned every person or every stakeholder is playing a part in putting this service together and making it effective so if you know everyday people wanted to be able to contribute for us to be able to design better services for them what would you recommend for them to be able to do or how could they contribute in this scenario and space people need to be incentivized to reflect respond to all of that and no matter what we say like we are in a busy world so to build a culture where people are actually spending time in thinking about something and then putting in effort to communicate it is a very big ask maybe they'll do it once or twice but you can't cultivate a habit out of it unless there is something coming back to them in return why are people so active on social media because they get social validation in return would you post stuff on facebook if people couldn't like or comment on it you wouldn't <laughs> that attention and that entire thing is token now so basically just keeping in mind how you can add value to your users or you know the people so that they can contribute back to you so i think that's a brilliant thought even when you talk about incentives we've come a long way from just looking at it which was very very transactional which was you know direct uh, it could be money it could be coupons etc cetera, etc cetera. now we've come to an era where we're uh, talking about value driven transactions where it doesn't necessarily have to be money so any thoughts on you know what are some value use that brands organizations watching us could add uh, while incentivizing their customers again coming back to what emotion is my brand evoking what response am i trying to get out of the user and then building my incentives around it you'll be surprised to know that social currency or you know social cool factors work better than like 500 rupees amazon gift card because 500 rupees amazon gift card will be used once and it's over but my social currency can reach millions of people so with that we'll close today's episode thank you for being here rishita it was lovely to have this conversation and i'm hoping that everybody watching us is able to go back with some insights from today and if not a good laugh and yeah stay tuned for more there are going to be a lot more stimulating conversations coming your way 
And meanwhile, feel free to like, share and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs>